What's up, guys? Welcome to the January 2020 live show. The first live show of the decade, right? So we are early. You can see the countdown screen there. And I am just here to make sure that all the stuff is working like it should. So if you could, please, for, for the early birds in chat, let me know if you guys can hear me okay all that fun stuff um making sure that there's nothing too glitchy about this live show let's see so yeah give me a holler if you guys can hear me mic check time if you need me to bump up the volume or something just let me know okay so keelan says it sounds good great So Mike Spencer says he's looking forward to the show. Yeah, it's been a little while since we've done a live show. I mean, we did one last month, but I think the uh, the interval was a little bit longer than what I'm used to. Salty Reef Girl says that uh, from Colorado, missed a few streams, but I'm here now. I feel like I've missed a few streams, but I guess I haven't. Brandon Wynn. Could you tell us who built your show tanks? Yes, uh, Reef Savvy down in Florida built my tanks. Harkins, good morning. Audio's good, video's good. Excellent, excellent. So the reason why I'm asking, I mean, I ask every single time about audio and visual and everything like that. And I'm always kind of just in the back of my mind a little bit concerned about technical difficulties or possible technical difficulties. Because while I was just uh, doing some ra random testing before we went live today, I happened to just be watching some YouTube while the broadcast software was off to the side and suddenly it just completely crashes. So I'm like, oh, I guess that's a, that's a possibility. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't happen during today's show. Okay, so while we are getting situated, I would like to extend a quick thank you to the Patreon crowd. So if you are interested in becoming a Patreon donor, you can go to patreon.com slash titlegardens. So these guys get a quick shout out. So Alan Jackson, Amy Bruner, Ann Lyons, Brandy Camp, Christopher Frame, Christopher H. Curry, Chuck and Meyer, Diane Rishworth, Jean A. Van Voorst, Gwen Nicodemus, Harkins Aquatics, who's in chat, Juanita Thralkeld, Catherine Kehoe, Kevin Cortez, Lisa Clow, Puddle Aquatics, Rico's Aquariums, Ryan Kern, excuse me, Sana Nominet or Nomine, uh, Skylar Korn, Tim Garner, Trevor Joseph Overbeck, Zara McIntosh, and then at an even pricier tier, we have Bill Russell and Jeremy Altman. So thank you guys so much for uh, supporting Title Gardens on Patreon. It's awesome. Uh, so what do people get for being a patron? So at the at the lowest uh, donation level, uh, you get to be put on the credits of every um, Title Gardens video, not the live sale, but uh, every, I guess, real Title Gardens video, you guys get some credits. And then at the $5 level, you get a shout out on this show, plus there are some packages for um, access to high-res images of the corals and stuff like that that we shoot. So you can see all the little perks and benefits um, when you go to patreon.com slash titlegardens. And we update them periodically as well. We never take something away, but we're always thinking of new things that we could be adding in. Okay. Harkins Aquatics, loved your flash sale last Friday. Couldn't find my gift card though. Um, send me an email, we can probably cook something up. Mike Spencer, how long uh, do you hold purchase corals for local pickup? Do you have hours when to pick up? So Mike, we don't have standard hours of operation. Um, so pretty much every visit is done by appointment. We're 
generally pretty flexible. We like to try to get all the corals out of here within a week, but if you've got some special circumstances or something like that, we can be accommodating. If it's like two months or something like that, probably less accommodating, but we try to stay a little bit flexible as far as pickup schedules go. Uh, Max, are you going to the Southeast Expo in South Carolina? We're not. Right now, we don't travel a whole bunch at all, but that may change in the future. Generally speaking, we attend less than three shows per year, and it's, it's very uncommon that we're out there. Uh, let's see, Derby City Reefer, are people able to visit your facility? Yes, by appointment. Uh, there are no open walk-in hours or anything like that. Everything is scheduled. Uh, Jessica J, hey Than, your video on polyp bailout showed an LPS frog spawn that attached to the bottom of one of your tanks. Did that polyp ever regrow its skeleton? Um, Jessica, I think it just vanished one day, and I don't remember seeing it ever again. So it probably didn't, uh, but it was a while ago, and things move around here quite a lot. It could have blown around, it could be in a different location, and still we haven't seen it. Uh, because that particular tank is a 240 gallon tank, and stuff disappears all the time in there. Uh, Joel Rodriguez, any rainbow chalice today? Um, I don't believe so, mainly because I don't believe we've ever really owned um, like the super high-end rainbow chalices. Uh, we've always been looking out for them, but at the same time, uh, before our tanks get fully established here, I like to, um, I, I guess I was gun shy about acquiring like really expensive corals because the greenhouse is fluctuates pretty greatly and so the, the a lot of the more delicate stuff it's kind of more of a risk out there but in here I, I, I view it as a less of a risk but we'll see how that works out Quonk reef keeping. I always wonder what the over under will be on the number of international shipping questions. You know, we get them uh, through email every single day, like, pretty much every day. Yeah, I don't think that people generally understand what goes into international shipping. It's a monstrously high bar to to do export, especially. So. Um, yeah, I've been looking into it a little bit more recently. I've been having these conversations, but uh, short of contacting fish and wildlife, there's nothing really going to be in the works. And you know, just me being willing to export does not mean that you will be able to import. So those are two very different things. That's not just like me. Oh, we'll just since I have all the paperwork done, I'm just going to FedEx you a box doesn't quite work out that way. There's authorities on both my end and on your end that has to be satisfied. And um, depending on what country you're in, that may not even be possible. Keelan, I ordered a, a shirt from you guys after my visit and got it yesterday. They're surprisingly soft. Excellent. Funny thing that you mentioned uh, t-shirts. So um, we made t-shirt designs a million years ago and they're like really basic stuff right and we've been kind of itching to do more in the way of offering t-shirt designs but uh, i'm not a good designer ben is really really busy and he is a self-admitted not a very good designer so one of the things that um, that's changed recently is we got a an intern and so just to evaluate her design skills, I was like, hey, why don't we start to put together some t-shirt designs? So if you haven't been to the Tidal Gardens channel in a little while and you see that little Teespring banner that goes right along the bottom, uh, you'll notice that there are a couple of new designs up there. And hopefully we'll be adding a couple more um, 
every week or so maybe but it's something just to this is a change of pace like i said we haven't updated any t-shirt designs in over a couple of years so take a look out for that if you're looking for that next level title garden swag right and i should probably provide t-shirts for my employees too like they haven't had new shirts in years as well Uh, Jeremy Young, Than, anything you know that I don't about Indonesia opening back up? Chris at ACI overloaded my brain. I don't know what you know. Um, so I'm not really in the import business, but I talked to import friends, and they said that it's, it's different this time around. Um, like the first shipments are going to be showing up in a week or two, at least in the United States. I know that in other countries, um, their authorities take longer to uh, approve all the necessary frameworks and everything like that. So for example, I know that in the UK it might be a little while longer. But um, as far as like what, what stuff I've heard is that, uh, sorry, I gotta get situated here, is that uh, it's gonna be mainly farmed corals. And uh, so I'm really not sure what to expect as to what is or is not going to be farmed. And I'm not really sure about pricing or anything. So it's, I don't know, I think it's kind of funny. I started this whole building project. Oh, and it uh, looks like the live show is up. So uh, yeah, check that out, titlegardens.com slash live if you're interested in purchasing. Um, but one of the funny things is when we start, started building this new uh, facility, it was pre-ban. So uh, it really wasn't part of our thought process or, or anything like that. But then by the time this building got done, the ban is being lifted. So it literally, this, this whole import-export ban out of Indonesia had little to no effect on, on anything we did. It's like, it's like nothing changed, except that uh, I, mainly I think that the wild colony stuff is probably not going to be available. But until I actually start seeing Indo corals show up at an importer, I don't really know. RV pilot. I live semi-local. When is a good time to visit? So the best uh, times to set up an appointment, it's going to be pretty much during the week, during work hours. So work hours is basically like, let's say, 8 to 4.30ish. But yeah, definitely reach out to us and we'll set up an appointment. Keelan says, do the coral prints. Uh, yeah, we should be doing exactly that. Because there's, so on Teespring, which is this uh, merch site that integrates with, uh, with YouTube, it's kind of neat. Uh, you get to see like all the different um, types of products that you could do. And yeah, you could do like framed prints, you could do mugs you could do hats and everything like that it just we just have to set aside time to to do the design work and in fairness the intern she uh, did do some designs but I think that her main focus excuse me is all stuff behind the camera so I, I if I if I had to guess she's more interested in still photography then videography and then the last little bit of her interest set would probably be stuff like editing. So we're, we're having her do it anyway, <laughs> but um, we'll, we'll see how, how far we get with that. But I would definitely like to get some more, uh, some more products up there on Teespring. Uh, let's see. So Alfredo... Reese Deus is asking, can you suggest a macro lens for the Black Magic, Black Magic Pocket 4K cinema camera? So I'm really, well actually, yeah, I mean, my, so that's a micro four thirds mount. And I think that the Olympus, um, basically I think it's a, fi a 50 millimeter macro, it's supposed to be very good. I haven't played around with it personally, but I remember when I was dabbling in micro four thirds land that that was a very highly regarded macro lens. Pretty much any macro lens is going to be pretty good. 
simply because of the geometry and an optics that goes into building a macro lens. It's a very simple, tried and true design. It's hard to mess up. And just by the very nature of a macro uh, design, they are tack sharp. So yeah, any true one-to-one -one macro will do really nicely. Uh, Zachary Buckland, tips for a Hollywood stunner chalice. Mine has amazing growth, but remains a pale brown. So if I was to mess with anything, I would look at lighting for that coral. It's not usually something that, that changes a ton with light. I would, I guess like just in our experience, they've mainly stayed very green. So maybe it's not getting enough light. Maybe it's getting too little light. Just play around with it. Chad Peoples, what is your shipping cost? So our shipping is a flat rate $39.99, but if your total is over $250, shipping is free. Silent one, he said $50, no, $39. So, well, $40, $39.99. The silent one, Dan, I deserve a wrench for all the work I'm putting in right now. <laughs> you got my shipping wrong, silent one. Just kidding. Uh, Jessica J, what's a wrench? It's a mod. So I have to be really careful about who I give wrenches to because I guess like, um, I guess it's possible for the people with wrenches to royally mess up a live stream. Uh, I'm not going to put it into anybody's heads, but let's just say that if somebody with a wrench wanted to mess something up in the community, they could do it. So it's, yeah, it's something that I just don't like hand out willy nilly. So pretty much everybody except maybe one or two people I've met personally. Uh, let's see. NC, or Chops NC, acclimation question. My LFS told me to stop drip acclimating. I soak in the sump for 15 minutes and three 15 minute half cup of tank water exchange. I don't plan on keeping SPS. Any ideas on plop and drop? So when it comes to, um, to drip acclimation, I don't really mind it so much, but I think people think about drip acclimating over the course of like three hours or something crazy like that. I would be looking to do drip acclimation over the course of like 10 minutes or something. Pretty much when, when it comes to how we introduce corals into our systems, it's not going to take more than 20 minutes of acclimation. XJet looked into bringing frags back from the Niagara show over the border. Ouch, no thanks. Yeah, I would not do that. Definitely would not recommend doing that. Like, I don't think that people quite realize uh, the risk that they're taking by trying to, to get corals over international boundaries, but this trade is regulated on the level of endangered species, and you could get an, an international treaty, by the way. So if you're going to get screwed up, you're going to get federally screwed up, possibly by two different governments. It's very, very bad news. Like that is not the kind of felony you want to be committing. That's a dumb, if you're going to be taking that risk, there's much more lucrative crimes you could be trying to commit, let's just say. Yeah, Marcus Aurelius187 uh, was saying, yep, the only disadvantage to drip acclimation I see is the temperature swings if it's a slow drip. Yeah, and the thing about drip acclimation that I like is that it is relatively smooth in the sense that you know you're not just like putting in cupfuls of water in there at an aggressive pace. Um, and we're talking about corals, not fish. So I wanted to make that clear as well. When it comes to fish, I think that the that it takes simply just takes longer, a lot longer, in fact. But for corals, twenty minutes should be fine. Uh, Seth Boyer, is there any way to reduce aggressiveness in a Hollywood stunner? So a Hollywood stunner chalice is by nature a highly aggressive coral, right? And one thing that I think could work, actually I'll give you three possible tricks that might work, probably won't work. One is 
UV sterilization to knock down a lot of organics in the water. Like a lot of what causes that aggressive interaction is just the um, the fact that the coral is detecting something in the water that it's responding to. The second thing is uh, ozone. Very esoteric. Not too many people are going to be running ozone, but ozone breaks down organic um, molecules also in circulation. It'll also kind of like make your water clearer. An analog to that might be something like activated carbon. So like those things, you're basically trying to remove a lot of these things that are bothering, bothering the coral in the water that it's responding to. Second thing is you just have to keep it further away from other corals. It can get a little bit tricky because it's a fast growing coral. You move it further away, it eventually grows back towards the things, other things. But those are some suggestions. So Homegrown Reefer is asking, hey, does the 2019 barbecue store credit expire? No, it does not. But if you lose it, you, you kind of lose it because um, we don't know who got what. So hopefully you haven't lost the actual code. Trul, him, oh no, if I waited one day, my pink leptoceres would have been 41% off. You know what? Send me an email. We might be able to, to give you a little bit of a, of a bump there to help you out. Send me an email. Uh, let's see. And yes, so there are two different sales that we do. We, we started to do a flash sale, like a Friday flash sale, which it's, there's no like live interaction or anything like that. But sometimes you'll, you'll see a, um, you'll see some pretty good discounts on something like that. And also during the live sale here. Now the other thing is, your pink leptoceris simply might be a larger piece, the one that you uh, get retail, versus you know, something smaller that you might get on this show. Depends. Silent one, been here for four years now, is only joking about the ranch. Yeah, I figured as much. Keelan, do you have a plan to keep your new building Aptasia free? What would a QT process aimed at eliminating any source of Aptasia look like? Every piece I've asked, every place I've asked said to rely on fish getting the babies. So a uh, couple of thoughts. So when you're talking about a coral farm, Aptasia is a super low risk, barely a nuisance sort of thing compared to like stuff that's really dangerous. So for most operations, Aptasia control can be done very easily with shrimp or fish, right? Either peppermint shrimp or a copper band or something like that that's known to eat Aptasia. Now for us, it's pretty simple um, because we're we're going through a much more aggressive quarantine process to get them into into this building and then into the tanks. So it'll be very unlikely for our new systems to get it just because like the, the way that we're cutting the corals and then gluing them down to new substrate, there's not a lot of real estate for even a baby Aptasia to latch onto to get into quarantine, but once it's into quarantine, it's going to have to hang out for two months undetected by us. Kind of unlikely. But then even if it did get into our system and then we saw an Aptasia, we're just going to kick it right back out. So a lot of times places will struggle with not being able to kick something out into another system and then go back through quarantine. So yeah, we do have some things in place, but also of all the things I worry about, uh, I worry about Aptasia like none at all. It's 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 such a it's such a low priority pest. Like the stuff that's towards the very top are things like Montipora eating nudibranch and Acropora eating flatworms and stuff that are legitimately difficult to deal with. But Aptasia that can be remedied literally by a five dollar shrimp. Aaron Schaefer, why do I have to be broke every time you have a live sale? Got to make choices. You got to plan. 
Uh, save nature. Are the corals on video from your new tanks? They are not. This is still at the greenhouse. Um, so, actually, I should bring up that, first of all, a lot of these shots were done by the intern. Pretty good, huh? So, I was, um, I was wondering how well that whole thing would go because this is her first time managing like a cinema camera. It's her first time like messing with a motorized slider. And I'm like, here you go. And so the first few times it, it took a little bit of, um, it took a little bit of coaching up because I've been doing this so long. I've probably taken 10,000 of these types of shots that a lot of stuff is just second nature intuitive for me. But it's like, oh, yeah, I should actually need to go about instructing this student on how to do this stuff so yeah that, that was kind of a thing but you know what um yeah these these shots i think they look, they look pretty good if i do say so myself now the other big change that we've made for this particular live show versus others is now that i do have an intern to help out is we're able to spend extra time take screen grabs of every single coral and use that as the thumbnail so when you go to titlegardens.com slash live, previously in every other live show, if you were interested in item number 26, for example, there's literally just a black and white square that says item number 26. If you want it, it's 30 bucks, right? But this time around, you can actually see the Samakora pictured. So hopefully that'll be helpful because I realize that a lot of you guys are viewing this on a phone and just seeing scrolling numbers doesn't exactly help you guys too much. Part of it was just uh, the, the, the time commitment to not only shoot, edit, and do all of this stuff, but also to do um, the thumbnail thing was quite extensive. But like I said, like I said, thank the intern. Oh, let's see. Mostly reefs, how do you manage Mojanos? I just physically remove them when I see them. I see uh, less than five a year. In fact, I see way less than five a year because I haven't seen any in the past three years, at least. At least, at least. Um, the thing about Majanos is they uh, are really, really, really tough, but they're not insanely prolific if you just stay on top of removing them. They're not quite like Aptasia where any like molecule gets scraped off of an Aptasia turns into 10 more. Like Majanos are kind of like little mini bubble tips that just happen to breed a lot. So you can just physically remove them as you see them and eventually they just kind of go away. Yeah, but like I said, you know, I would, I would even go as far as to say if we got Majanos, I would be a little excited because it's like oh cool I can just put these things into a little uh, little pest jar container and set it on my desk or something and it'll be fine because they're actually kind of pretty they, they require like no real maintenance or anything like that uh, but like I said I really haven't seen any and I apologize I'm like a good minute behind on on chat but I have to I have to cover some things on my list so Sleaze Stack is asking, any advice on getting rid of hydroids? Uh, yes, you're not going to like my answer, though. It is going to be you with a siphon and tweezers ripping them out by hand over the course of months. That is the best way. The silent one, Tidal Gardens, I want to schedule an appointment in a couple weeks. That is cool. You can. Uh, just to let you know, though, you might not see me because in a couple weeks, I will be on vacation to Costa Rica. <laughs> but the staff here will take good care of you. Old Man Reefer, Than, have you ever thought of selling aquacultures? Oh, aquacultured live rock. Okay, it's like you, you kind of got broken up into two different things there. Um, no, I really haven't considered it. When it comes to rock, we don't have that much in our systems. I bet like, I bet a large aquarium has more live rock than we have in 5,000 gallons. Uh, in fact, I'm in a little bit of a quandary as to sourcing good rock right now because I have this 
big show tank. I have two big show tanks to fill up. And I'm looking at my rock options and I'm really not in love with all the options. I know Mar Marco Rock are very uh, popular. I know Real Reef is out there. I think a few other companies are out there. And my absolute favorite is taking like real reef live rock, completely sterilizing it, bleach white, and starting with that. It is just a completely different material than everything else out there. It's expensive. Um, not looking forward to have to the amount of something like that that I would have to get to fill my tanks. But yeah, when it comes to when it comes to rock, it's like I, I wish there was a super light, super porous calcium carbonate based material that I could just use and preferably not ripping out of the ocean. That'd be nice too, because I just want it to be completely dead and sterile. If I were to email you, would you able to put me together a plating Monty pack? Uh, we could probably do that. Yeah, we, like we'll just uh, if you just buy like an SPS beginner pack or something like that, we can make sure that you get a bunch of different plating Montys. Yeah, but send us an email. Two please must be sleeping. Yeah, yeah. I've noticed like noticed the lack of super chats right there. No two please, no super chats. Akan Lord says, I wouldn't actually mind having Majanos. At least they look nice. I mean, within reason. You don't really want that in, in the large show tank because they will they will win, let's just say. If you, if you let them grow to, to insane levels, they will win. And one tank that I've seen where the person had was moving and they've com completely neglected the tank because they plan to rip the whole thing down and build something new entirely. They let themselves go as far as uh, Majanos are concerned, and they were swimming. Like the anemones were floating around the tank. They covered every flat surface of rock and were like tumbleweeds that were just blowing around. It's like, oh, that's how bad that could get. So, yeah, bad. Hello, is it possible to ship to Poland? Unfortunately, no, it is not possible. We only ship to the US. The silent one, I'd rather deal with you. Okay, so you have to dodge my vacation, which is gonna be the last week of January. Or no, 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 I take that back. It's the first week of February. I'm leaving right at the end of January. Any advice on selling coral locally via Facebook and or Craigslist? Uh, no. Uh, so I don't think it's allowed on Facebook any longer. I don't think that that's, I mean, I know that a lot of pages just get shut down left and right on Facebook. We've never done it. Uh, on Craigslist, your mileage may vary. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe there's a whole bunch of Craigslist people that, that can give you better advice. But yeah, I don't mess with, with Craigslist at all. Dan, why not just make your own rock? I looked at what is involved. Um, kind of a messy process. I might, but it's it looks kind of messy. Tech your talk. What is up? What's up? <laughs> Good to see you uh, were able to, to pull away and hang off with us for a little bit. So by the way, if any uh, if there's any more camera questions or lens questions, now is the time because Tech Your Talk knows a lot when it comes to about the uh, the equipment end of the spectrum because he, he sees a lot more things than I do like I know a lot about what I'm shopping for but what I'm shopping for 90% of it is not consumer stuff so when people ask me like what should I get for my my, my Sony a7 III I'm like I don't know I've never even held the camera I'm familiar with it I've never held it Tech Your Talk is your guy he's yeah, he's always hands-on with, with a lot of um, the ongoing tech, so. Let's see. Yeah, so Marcus really is, it takes a long time to cure to be pH safe. 
Yeah, I heard it's like a really long time. And the, the amount that I have to do is out of this world. Because, I mean, the, the, the tanks that I'm, I'm filling are they're 10 feet by 4 feet wide. Big, big tanks. Uh, Brian Starbuck, do you typically have the designer name Zoas on sale during these live streams? Some, I guess. We do have Zoas. That's a Zoa. I didn't know to plan for this month, but I can totally be ready next month. Yeah, and, and just keep an eye out for when we do our uh, Friday flash sales, as well as these YouTube live shows. Uh, those are two different outlets. Uh, if, if you're if you're looking for something like really specific, um, it's best just to like check out the website. To be perfectly honest, because if it if it's a super high end, low volume Zoa for us, you're not gonna save a ton of money when it comes to one of these shows like for example we have these like bright yellow larger polyp zoanth that's called macaws they're they're like 80 dollars or something like that for just a couple of polyps and there's like a long list of people waiting for that so i mean that sort of thing is pretty much going to sell exclusively through the website so if if, you, if there's stuff that's a little bit more common that we have excess supply of it shows up on these these discounted platforms Keelan says, in regards to visiting the farm, I can confirm Ben is a good time and worth your time. Yeah, he's going to be a lot nicer than I am, too. <laughs> Generally speaking, I'm not usually this, this bright and pleasant. No, it's, it's fine. Uh, most, I, I think the people that, that have met me probably would disagree with that. So anyway, Ben is good. Ben will take good care of you. Uh, Aunt Rami is asking, any tips for ACANs and SPS? Two very different things. You might want to check out my individual videos on the two because my advice for the two is going to be pretty different uh, in, in certain ways. But one thing that I can say is that all these corals appreciate stability, especially towards the SPS end of the spectrum. So the more consistent you can keep your parameters, your lighting, everything, the better you will have success with those different corals. I think acans need to be fed quite a lot, but then again, um, we're getting more into into feeding SPS things like amino acids and whatnot, and maybe looking into coral nutrition as well would be would be helpful in addition to the the stability of your system. Holly does. Tidal Gardens have any branded coral variants? Not so much. So when it comes to like all the coral naming stuff, I the, the, the way that we try to name stuff is first we look up Google image searches for everything that, that we can kind of identify. And sometimes it is as simple as saying like green Acropora, find the one that looks exactly like ours and using the most popular name that shows up in Google search. Because we are all about, cause we, we know what, what drives traffic to our site. It is Google search and practically nothing else. I think like 80% of our traffic comes from Google search. So when Google search says such and such name, that's the one we're going with. I don't care what brand company had originally named it. Do not care. It is only SEO driven for us. We try really hard to not name something because when you've been doing it for a little while you run out of ideas everything kind of starts to sound the same um, I'm not really that creative to begin with and at the end of the day if nobody else is calling it such and such coral name that you just came up with it's not gonna come up in Google search either which doesn't help anybody especially not me so uh, long story short uh, we don't really go out of our way to name stuff if we simply can't find um, a, a, a relatively used popular name for something then we'll have to come up with something but generally no 
Is a Sigma Canon 105mm macro enough to take pictures from front to back of your aquarium, two feet front to back? Yes, absolutely. So those things can infinity focus. So you can shoot a mountain range that's like, you know, 30 miles away. It doesn't really matter. But um, the thing that you're going to be dealing with just from a photography sense, going two feet front to back into your glass tank, is the uh, distortion of glass when you shoot at any angle other than dead perpendicular, and it's also just the clarity of the water, uh, is going to greatly diminish your, your image quality. Because two feet's a, a really long way underwater. Old Man Reefer, what is the best way to get reflection out of glass when shooting video? Guys are asking questions when you don't like, you're not gonna like the answer. Best way is to eliminate the source of light that's causing that reflection. So if it's a window or something like that, you block the window. Second best way is if it's a hard reflection, like you can see what is being reflected, that's called a first order reflection, first order light scattering. The best way to get rid of that, short of blocking that light source, is to use a polarizing lens. So if I remember from physics, light wavelengths has like a, it's like a, imagine like a sine wave, right? But then you can imagine like a second sine wave that's perpendicular to it. And so what a polarizer does is by aligning it to the to one of the 90 degree axes it will remove one of those sine wave functions of the light so you can take one of these um, like circular polarizers and look at uh, like the top of your tank and you'll see like this hard reflection from the lights and everything like that and you, when you tr take this uh, circular polarizer that you screw into the front of your camera and you turn that sucker into about 90 degrees between 0 to 90 depending and it'll just completely eliminate that uh, that hard reflection. You can see straight down into the tank. It's kind of cool. Third way, remove it in post. <laughs> Have to throw that in there, I guess. Uh, Dominic Frost, fan. My plating Montipora has white dead spots. What could have caused this? There were no pests besides an Estrina star I had already removed. Um, if anything settles on the coral, that could cause some damage. Sometimes uh, new plating Montes and stuff like that, they can get, if, if they don't like something in the water, the way that they kind of tighten down will, will rip their flesh at certain points. Um, it could be honestly any number of problems. Evan Keith, have you ever thought about adding colony pictures to your website to go next to the pictures of a frag? Would help to know what the little frag can grow up to be. We've considered it, yeah. There's, uh, we're slowly doing an audit of the images, for especially for stock items on the website. And when possible, we might be starting to include some colony pictures. When possible, because a lot of times we don't have colonies. Like, we don't keep mother colonies so to speak. We pretty much trim everything down. Two please with the 499. Sorry, I'm so late. Hey, Than. Hey, all. We were just talking about how um, how two please must still be sleeping or something. And I'm like, yeah, I noticed because there's no super chats other than two please. And sure enough, two please comes in with the 499. That's hilarious. Thank you, though. Appreciate it. And for everyone that's watching, super chats are appreciated. Definitely not necessary. We're, we're selling corals, right? So if you want to support us uh, and you don't want to do the super chat thing, no worries. But, you know, hey, buy coral, right? Buy coral. Uh, Marcus Release 187, I wish people would attach scientific names to these hippie named corals. Could, except most of them would be wrong in one shape or another and they change. 
somewhat frequently. So for example, this, uh, this Florida Recordia that we're looking at, the scientific name is Recordia Florida. <laughs> That that's pretty easy, <clears throat> but there there's certain there's certain uh, sp not s there's certain stony corals mainly LPS that they uh, they change teams they get traded. So like what you th what, when I say scolemia, the coral that you're thinking of in your head if I say the word scolemia, pretty much guaranteed is not a real scolemia anymore. Used to be, it's not anymore. Um, if I said an acanthastria. It's a really good chance that the picture of, of a coral that just popped into your head, not an acanthastria. So, how, would it be helpful? Maybe. I don't know. I don't think it changes the care requirements much. Uh, let's see. Uh, the silent one seems like prices have gone up on things. Depends. Some things are higher. Some things are lower. There, when we did the flash sale on Friday, uh, don't remember which Friday it was. Maybe it was like two weeks ago, or maybe it was last week. There were some really deep discounts on certain things. It it just depends a lot on our our stock. That has a lot to do with it. Vladimir Naz Nazarian, sorry, I'm gonna butcher your name. My bad. Do you ship to Paris, France? Unfortunately, no. It uh, we only ship to the U.S. Though. Nick Walters, hi, Than. What are your thoughts on the partial lifting of the Indo ban? Um, I don't really know what to think of it yet. Uh, so the the corals, as far as I know, aren't in the country yet. We're, we should be seeing them fairly soon. I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what's going to show up. Um, I think that getting more variety into um, into the selection, I think it will be really good. And two please, $1.99, thank you again for the super chat. How is Indo? Uh, yeah, I, I'm curious to see because it's, from what I understand, it's it's going to be farm-raised, maricultured corals that are the only things that, that are going to be allowed in. Um, from what I understand, the last time that it got shut down to begin with, <clears throat> there were issues with people sending out wild corals as maricultured corals, and there's a lot of Wild West type corruption going on. And so the government, part of their rationale for shutting it all down was just this uh, completely illegal behavior going on and not the enforcement mechanisms in place to, to monitor or correct that. So this time around, I'm wondering if it's going to be like, oh, this is really only mariculture or if it's going to be like a little bit fringe Wild Westy. Because even um, in non-Indo countries, there's like some screwiness when it comes to, uh, let's just say, completely legal import-export. Uh, I've seen some, some corals come through Australia, for example, that are 100%, 0% chance that they came from Australia, let's just say. But they got through, permit-wise, was not Australian. So we'll see. We'll see, um, but I think that I'm I'm excited for it just because for the last like two years or something we've been seeing hardcore primarily Australian corals, and there was a time that Australian corals were like the rage because they were the new thing, but people I think really undersold how good and how pervasive Indo corals were, and. It was only after the ban took place that I that I learned that like Indo was ninety percent of the import industry, like ninety percent. Everything else, all the other geographies, Fiji, um, Tonga, all these places, occupied a small sliver compared to Indonesia. So to get that variety back, even if it is just the the farmed cultured stuff, I, I'm I'm interested to see.
Yeah, Tampa Bay. Okay, so Harkins Aquatics. Going back to our, our talk about um, about rock, right? Pecani is available, but you want to kill it, so it would be prohibitively expensive to bleach. Exactly. So, I mean, I even was talking to people about importing it directly and, and all that goes into it. It is it's shockingly expensive, even just at the at the import level, and because you're talking about shipping rock, and there's like weight quotas and stuff like that, and and to fill fill a plane, filling a plane and having it ship anything to you is going to be expensive, and that's assuming they don't charge you for anything that's actually on board the craft, but once you start paying for rock by the pound to fill said plane and then to send said plane over to you, it's going to be really expensive. So, we'll see. Akan Lord has a question about Camp Nella, in, which is a soft coral for those of you guys that don't know. I have this green one with tan polyps and somehow it's doing very well, but the brown ones always die somehow. Yeah, I really don't know. That's not a that's not a particularly common soft coral. Um, yeah, lost me on that one. Sorry. So uh, Brandon is is asking if you don't ship to Canada, what retailers would you recommend? Uh, I've never shopped in Canada. <laughs> uh, so the only the only Canadian store or it like business I'm even aware of that ever even gets brought up to me is Refraft. And I've seen some pictures of their SPS. It looks pretty cool. I have no no input on them as a company to deal with or anything or how they do business or if they still exist. I have no idea. It's the only Canadian anything I've heard of. Jamie Burgess. Hi, Than. From the UK. Hello. I know you recently visited the UK and don't ship here. Whilst you were here, did you find any decent coral farms that you would recommend? Um, so I spent most of my time, so I only saw really two places. Um, I saw, uh, I saw, I am blanking, AAC, um, which is, I think, Advanced Aquarium Consultancy, and I saw Eco Marines, and and I actually I also saw um, oh who are those guys Charterhouse Aquatics. So my exposure to a lot of the stores in the UK is is kind of limited, but um, yeah, I mean those are some that that I thought were good. Matt, why does color temperature constantly rise? Uh, so we we do a special effect on the coral. So it's really, really, really subtle. But if you were to play back the, 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 this clip at speed, you'll see that the color temperature, like looking at the coral, goes from a yellow color that's more daylight to a blue color that is more actinic. So it, it, it's not a practical effect. So right now, as it starts, it starts off looking more yellow, but as it progresses, you'll see it transition to the actinic color. And Tech Your Talks got me ready. Thank you. Uh, Toxic Aquatics um, is asking, who do you ship through, and is it overnight shipping? Yes, we ship UPS overnight. So most places get UPS overnight in the morning. Most places. Some, some places it'll be like noon or early afternoon. Kind of uncommon. Most of the time it is uh, there before 10.30 a.m. Unless you start to approach holidays, at which point they make no guarantees on when it's going to get delivered. Nick Walters, AAC is my LFS, excellent shop. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. It's very clean and there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, Aunt Rami is asking, would you ever sell clams? 
Uh, we've done that in the past. We're not well suited for clams here. The way that we do maintenance, they don't like it. They, so they end up dying on us a lot of times. Uh, so we, we kind of uh, kind of hit and miss on clams. We might, I, I never say never, we might try it again, maybe. Uh, Adam, did, did you use to ship FedEx or am I confused? Yes, we used to ship FedEx. Um, so the whole FedEx UPS thing, we've, we've used both companies and at different times, one provides us better service than the other. And unfortunately, it's kind of schizophrenic on our end as to which one is kind of good at any given time. So we might have like a great rep and then that rep will get promoted or something and the person that replaces that great rep, it's like, hmm, you're very different. My whole experience with this whole process is very different. And then uh, it's how they deal with you when stuff goes wrong can sometimes be different. Like for example, um, this is somebody else's story, but I will convey it to you because I'm pretty sure that's probably happened to me too And I just didn't pay that close attention to it But when you send out a package, okay, first of all, there's no such thing as insurance for these things um, They don't they don't cover livestock of any kind so they'll if, if absolutely nothing goes wrong, but they deliver late you can get uh, some money back for the, the, the shipping costs, right? That is literally a bright sunny skies, nothing wrong, package showed up late anyway. If they can point to anything, engine failure, driver called off, it was snowing, there was ice, fog, whatever. Anything that can say, say, hey, we had a problem, act of God, that's a thing. Um, no refunds of any kind. So one time there was, let's say 10 boxes. Driver comes, picks it up from here. It goes to Cleveland Hopkins Airport. At Cleveland Hopkins Airport, uh, it all gets loaded on the same plane that's gonna go to, I'm not gonna say which place because then you'll know which company I'm talking about. It's going to go, go to a single location, and that's where it's going to then get distributed from, okay? All 10 boxes had a different reason for why it was delayed. Some of them said fog, some of them said rain, some of them said snow, some of them said engine failure, whatever it is. But it was 10 completely different reasons, and we know all of that was leaving on one plane. So I'm like, okay, you're gone. <laughs> so that is not my story. I, I'm relaying a story, right? And so that company that had that issue switched. But I've had like similar weirdness happen and you bounce to the other company. They do great a great job, but then there's always the possibility that the worm could turn. It's like, oh, we're doing this again. Okay, all right. Apparently, I have to like schedule some rate negotiations in the, this in this week's calendar but yeah that that's long story short we use FedEx or we use UPS currently we used to use FedEx and this isn't the first time we've switched back and forth either we've done the FedEx UPS FedEx back to UPS thing multiple times it's not me we're the same every single time it's like they, they changed right underneath me. It's like, oh, oh, okay. We're, we're, I, I guess I'm doing, doing business with a different company now. Uh, toxic. I'm, I'm sure somebody's already answered your question, but I will answer it in case anybody else is wondering. Do I have to pick it up from their location? I've never ordered livestock online yet. You do not have to pick it up from our location. If you are local, you have that option of scheduling an appointment and coming and seeing us directly and, and picking it up there. Uh, otherwise, we do ship. The shipping rate is $39.99, flat rate, unless your order is over $250, at which point we are shipping to you for free. <laughs> mm. 
Devin Thurber, have you thought about buying the buying out the dollar store uh, glue company yet? Uh, funny. So we place orders right uh, through this dollar store thing, and we have it have it uh, dropped off at the dollar store. We buy multiple cases of this. Like at any given time, they might have a dozen packets there. So we've just circumvented the whole process. We buy a big volume and just have it sent to that location. They just call us when it's ready. Just go there, grab it up. One time though, they shorted us. I like, how do you, how do you guys short us? Because I think we, we ordered like, I don't know, 20 something cases and they only had like 16 of the 20 something cases. And it took them like a few extra weeks to fulfill the rest of it. I'm like, what? Where's my stuff? Uh, Matt, good question coming up here. Are there any downsides to using Vibrant for algae? We've only been messing with Vibrant now for uh, seven weeks, maybe, something along those lines. I'm very happy with the results. The only thing that, that I'm seeing that might be a thing is the way that the bacteria or whatever it's doing is affecting the algae might also be affecting the corals and they might be down coloring slightly. So if you look at this live sale, um, for some reason, I, I would expect slightly better coloration given the fact that we're into mid-January. But that might just be my bias speaking. So if you compare this live show with live, live like the January live shows last year, year before, year before that, I mean, granted, photography might have changed. Who knows? A whole bunch of stuff might have changed. The bulbs were newer back then. Who knows? But I have a feeling that the color, you know, I'm looking at these, these Gooster Zoas, for example. They look kind of nice. <laughs> so maybe it's just um, recency bias. But um, yeah, as far as like losing corals or anything, absolutely not. Everything so far has been like simply outstanding. Um, to the point that I'm thinking about, oh, I don't have an algae problem. I don't care. I'm going to continue to use it just so it suppresses any algae problem that wants to come up. Uh, the, especially with zoas, like so, I didn't have an algae problem going into my to my vibrant experiment. The reason why I tried it at all was uh, there's like a, a very specific film type algae that messes with my zoas. It just barely covers it, and it, it kind of just prevents the the polyp from fully opening. And so what happens is over time the polyp just stops opening. I have to go back in there and 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 um, either brush it off with a with a, a makeup brush or blow it off with a turkey baster. But long story short, my zoas were kind of struggling because of this one particular type of nuisance algae that affects nothing else. And and a, a couple of frag plugs might be a little dirtier or something like that so very minor stuff it's not like oh my gosh we have this huge uh, algae issue we don't never did really now what we noticed was that all of that stuff after a few weeks really just broke down and now my my zoanthids are just loving life like if they're closed it's not because of this little little minor algae issue now the other thing about vibrant is just how it like polished up and just cleaned up everything. So the amount of time that we spend trying to clean algae is is greatly minimized. The okay, so you you asked for like downsides. This is purely speculation on my part, but I think that what's happening with Vibrant is that it, it kills off the the weak stuff first, and it kills it off in mass very effectively. And what that does is it opens up opportunities. It's like Batman beating up low-level um, robbers and like bank robbers and like people that were like mugging some lady trying to get their purse. He's beating up all these like you know homeless people and stuff like that, right? Because Batman's a, a rich weirdo. And then and then he starts taking on organized crime and he's like starts to like to knock out the mafia bosses and all this stuff. 
Well, when you create this vacuum, uh, it, it creates like this opportunity for like really dangerous things to like bubble up. And that's when you start to get into his like whole rogues gallery, right? That's kind of what's happening that we've noticed because we don't really, again, we didn't really have an algae issue. But we had like bryopsis pop up for the first time in forever. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting because all the algae is gone except for this little patch of bryopsis. And it's like really weak bryopsis. So we're like, scrape, 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 siphon, 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 all gone. And then it, it, it pops up like little patches here and there. I'm like, okay, I think that's really all it is. It's just we've created this vacuum of, of opportunity for like the really rough stuff that can survive Batman to like proliferate. And eventually they will get tamped down too because like I said, we're not super long into it. And, and also it just takes longer to deal with some of those, um, the really tough allergies anyway. Things like Valonia, Bryopsis and stuff. So I'm giving it some time and it's not like it's an infestation of it either. It just popped up in one place, whereas before we would never see it. But I think that back then it was just kind of suppressed by the rest of the algae that was consuming the nutrients. So that's that's my take on that. All right. I apologize. I'm way behind on comments. Let me get caught up here. Uh, Aunt Raimi, do so I'm, I'm going to go as fast as possible. Are walking dendros like anemones? Do they sting other corals or are they somewhat safe? They're basically an LPS. So if you're worried about a Duncan stinging something that it touches, imagine that a walking dendro is kind of like that. <laughs> Nava down south. Memphis, Tennessee, FedEx, lol. <laughs> yeah, so it's, if I said, if I said uh, Louisville, K Kentucky, you know who I'm talking about. If I say uh, Memphis, Tennessee, you know who I'm talking about? Exactly. Adam says, yep, business side of logistics, we have the similar stuff all the time. And that's not just me. <clears throat> Certain customers are like, hey, can you please send by the other carrier? Because that carrier in this town delivering to my house sucks. The other place does a much better job once it gets to me. And I understand that, but we can't. <laughs> Oh, I appreciate your answer. Uh, so this is Toxic Aquatics again. I appreciate your answer. No one has answered it yet, though. I meant from the UPS location or to do they deliver it to my house? I've heard of people having to pick up from the airport. Okay, <laughs> definitely not the airport. So airport is air freight. So like I am shipping, uh, I'm basically getting it onto the plane sort of thing. And then the plane shows up and that's usually like same day delivery type stuff. I don't mess with that. Uh, that's more like a, a wholesale relationship sort of thing. And I'm not a wholesaler. The, the, what I mean by UPS next day air is it will deliver to your house. Now, some people don't want it delivered to their house. Uh, and I'm not even going to the whole like, you know, spouse angle with that. Uh, sometimes their local driver situation, it's going to be too late. So they'd rather have it uh, be delivered earlier to a FedEx location that they can then pick up earlier. So that's what that's all about. Unless you tell me to send it to a specific UPS location, it is coming to your doorstep. So hopefully that, that answers that. Okay, let's see. Bert Minishu, Minshu. Uh, WWC Neon Green Star Polyp closes for one month, then came out with a vengeance, but now half are small polyps in purple. Why? Uh, not really sure on that, just because you don't really associate green star polyps with changing appearance drastically. Now, as far as, oh, I guess any coral, if it's really shocked to an unhappy state, I suppose it could swap out Zozantheli and change their appearance slightly. And that sounds like it was stressed out for a while. Uh, that's not to say that it can't reincorporate Zozantheli from another source to change color slightly back again. Hard to kind of say. Also, adjusting to um, a new tank, um, you know, that could be. 
that could cause some differences. Uh, but again, like green star polyps, not not the top of my list as to what could be changing. You know, I'm thinking like acans, acros, things like that. Some of the more expensive monties will change color. Green star polyps kind of look like green star polyps. Green star polyps. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. Uh, so the only thing that I would suggest is, since it's doing well, to keep it doing well, provide a little bit more flow. That's usually like my number one piece of advice I always give for that coral. It gives them the best chance for success. I'm still a million years behind the comments. <laughs> Harkins Aquatics basically just listening. Cool. Just glad to have you, dude. Next time you're in Ohio, you have to come back over. Uh, what kind of steps, if any, so this is king coral, what kind of steps, if any, can I skip with cycling and filtering a frag tank plant for LPS only and no fish? You know, I don't know if you can skip steps. Like I, I was setting up my quarantine tanks recently and we were incorporating uh, bio blocks that were cycled in our show tanks in, in the new building. And we thought, you know, we're just going to take this big old block of a filter media and just, you know, we're probably going to bypass the cycle entirely. We didn't. The, that little quarantine setup of ours totally had a cycle. And I think that the acros that we were uh, quarantining in there did not appreciate going through a cycle. So I, I, I play, play it real conservative on this. Go through the process. Be patient. Don't be like me. Well, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Take your time. Uh, so Adam, Adam is asking, is it working suppressing all types of algae? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, we're talking about vibrant, going back to the vibrant topic. Yes. Uh, Mostly reefs. Than might be robin. <laughs> nope. If I'm if I'm anybody, yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I've always said it. it's like if 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 I was anything in the DC universe, I would be the Joker, hands down. Uh, it's a me Mario is asking. What kind of salt do you use? I use Omega C. How do you like Fritz? I have never used Fritz. However, uh, I like those guys. <laughs> I like Sean and the whole team over at Fritz. Uh, so every interaction that, that I've had with Fritz as a, as a company has been has been positive. Um, I I just I simply just don't use their product. Um, and so it's normally I'd be like I, I should give their product a try, but. I'm not a regular hobbyist, and for, for me to change something as core uh, as salt, what, what people are asking me to do is putting millions of dollars at risk. And I'm really not doing that <laughs> for anything. So um, yeah, so unless my current brand royally screws up and I lose millions of dollars of stuff, I'm probably not going to switch to any, anything else. So. I, I have not had the opportunity to try Fritz or Brightwell or any of these other brands of salt. Uh, the only other brand that we've tried in the past was um, Instant Ocean. Instant Ocean was fine. The only reason we're not using Instant Ocean currently is because of logistics of actually physically getting the salt to us. It was a bit of a pain, so we've moved on. We use Omega C. Um, my only problem with Omega is that it mixes up dirty. so. It's like really gross at the bottom of our of our salt makeup station, and we have to go in there and really clean it, and it still is kind of dirty. But from what I understand, a lot of salts are dirty. So who knows? Uh, okay, I see uh, some people asking about lighting. I don't know. I'm trying to get caught up on all the lighting talk. So, yeah. So somebody was asking about 
Gavitas for coral. Like high-tech grow lights. Never heard of it. Um, yeah. There, there's a really pretty straightforward reason why I, I go with Ecotech. So first off, I kind of like their lights. I've used them in, in the past. Uh, but Ecotech as an aquarium company, when it comes to customer service, is the best I have ever seen. And whenever I've had whenever I've had a problem, it is no questions asked, um, like super easy to deal with. You know, I've got a good rep. I've I've, I've talked to a bunch of their different um, you know folks in marketing and everything like that. We've always been able to work out deals pretty seamlessly, and yeah, like it's when you when you're talking about like especially industrial level stuff uh, and and getting to you know commercial scale. It almost is irrelevant what the best technology is, and Ecotech is actually towards you know I, I'd say that most people would consider Ecotech towards the, the top end of the technology spectrum anyway, but when it comes to like again the the customer service relationship with a company, I've never seen a better company than Ecotech to work with. Uh, there, there's a couple that are that are high on my list. But, but Ecotech is in like rarefied air. And not every company is like that. I, I would say that a good half of aquarium companies, uh, I would prefer to really never deal with ever again. It's, they're, they're, it's not even that they're, oh, they're just, they're okay. Most of them are actually bad. Most of them are actually really bad. So if there's like any risk of that versus like the, the tried and true, um, like I really know what to expect with a certain company. I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna stick with them, until uh, so basically until they start really sucking. I'm not changing my lights. Try not to, anyways. <laughs> yeah, like we used a lot of um of, of T5 over in in the greenhouse, and the reason why I don't I don't make as much of a deal about um. Oh, what, what what about the service there? It's like those lights are a hundred bucks. Like I don't expect any service. I expect them to one day die and I'll throw them away, sort of thing. But once you're actually putting in some serious money behind behind higher end lighting, uh, that's when who you're buying from matters more so than the lighting itself, practically. So okay. One thing about the, the grow lights, they represent the sun better than any grow light out there. You know what represents the sun better than any light? The actual sun. And we have that in the greenhouse, and the actual sun is not what you want in these tanks. I can tell you from 10 years experience how flawed the real sun is when it comes to growing coral. Yes, Matthew says Ecotech is in Pennsylvania and Iowa, so it's close to Ohio. Yeah, you know what's funny is that um, one of the one of their guys, uh, Jay, that works at Ecotech. You know, we've we've exchanged emails back and forth and everything like that. And he he's in uh, I don't know he's within driving distance of my location. The first time we ever met was in England of all places. All the times that we could have met in the states never happened, but we met in the UK. Uh, let's see. How's the new coral farm going? Pretty good. Uh, we are currently um, just managing the quarantine process, so we're we're setting up tanks. There's uh, there's probably about two thousand gallons currently running, and it has literally two damsels in it. Big plays. We're making some big plays over here. Holly is asking, do you have a personal tank or just the farm? I have just the farm. Within the farm are two ginormous show tanks that are empty right now. And I, I should probably tell you a little, about, little bit about my, my issue with these big show tanks. They're really big, like really, really, really big. And when you start to like break down like, man, how much rockscape am I gonna have to put in? And Here's the thing, you know, it just occurred to me that I probably haven't had a show tank of my own in my possession for about 20 years. 
I've been doing like the coral farming thing so much that I really never felt that that was a missing element in my life to, oh, you know what I need? I haven't had a reef tank. No, I've never felt that. So looking at this now, it's like, you know, I really want to do a very ambitious aquascape. And I'm, I think that like my mind is going towards some designs that are really difficult, which should be, you know, par for the course at this point. We do the difficult things here stuff that people are unwilling to do or haven't figured out how to do or or whatever but i'm trying to like formulate how to accomplish this really challenging design and i'm talking with some people about like what how how, how do i get this appearance um which is like as much magic trick as it is stacking rock so we'll see how that goes it could be a horrible failure but we're gonna try it not gonna give you too much, too much there. Okay. AL, fan, can you expand on that thought? Why is the sun flawed at growing coral? Okay, so the thing that's, that's messed up about the sun is that, first of all, with real sun, you're getting seasonality. So there's a big difference in photo period and intensity going from summer to winter. That's the obvious big overarching thing, right? The other thing is your corals, the, most of your corals, not all of them, but most of your corals, are not being grown in six inches of water. So the spectrum that they're receiving from the sun in your tank is most likely the wrong spectrum. And if, you're, if you've ever been a diver or gone diving, the difference between being, uh, let's say, 5 feet underwater, 30 feet underwater, and 100 feet underwater, those are three different universes of light. So within the first you know, 30 feet, you're gonna pretty much see a rapid drop off in like the yellows and oranges and stuff. It is physically getting absorbed and removed. So by the time, just 30 feet down, most of those corals are only seeing blue. Once you get to like 100 feet, it is only that, that like near ultraviolet blue look that you're gonna see, if anything. You won't see a hint, and not, I mean not even a hint of yellows or reds or greens or anything like that any of like the, the longer wavelength stuff all gone only like the, the higher powered short wavelength stuff is going to get there so most of the the tanks that that we keep they're 12 inches deep meaning the corals are above that right uh it's it's not the greatest for that. It's just all wrong. And you're gonna get like, well, you, you might get good coloration in certain areas. You might get less great coloration in others. There's a lot of, of wonkiness there. And again, the seasonality that plays into it can mess stuff up. Okay. Matthew, sick update. We're at two international shipping questions and two Indo band questions. <laughs> Figured somebody was keeping score. Uh, let's see. Than, what is the danger level of low pH when it comes to corals? Assuming other stuff are okay and the drop is not sudden. Okay, so chronically low pH is probably what I would. If I could think of any analog, it'd be like osteoporosis. So a calcium reactor will dissolve um, media at about a pH of a little over 7, 7.1, 7.2. They're supposed to run in the, in the 6 range, 6 point something, but media does dissolve right around 7, most media anyway. 
So if your um, if your pH is chronically low, there is a possibility that you, your corals are dissolving their skeleton just being in that water. So it, it could cause them to have like a more brittle skeleton, a lighter skeleton, any kind of like growth issues associated with that. So there, there could be a number of, of problematic things with chronically low pH. I don't really know what you mean by low pH, but if like our tanks are consistently about 8.3, but I would start worrying if they were dipping to about 7.9. I don't like to see 7.9. Bill Carson is asking, in a new tank, do you advise people to try for lower nutrients than an older tank? I want to avoid the uglies, but don't want to go for zero nutrients as that leads to dinos. Um, do you advise people to try for lower nutrients? I don't know if I ever really do the super low nutrient thing whether it's an, a new tank or an older tank or anything like I um, I think you're gonna run into a lot more issues bottoming out things like nitrate and phosphate than um, if you were to to have slightly elevated like I would feel way more comfortable if my nitrates were 15 and um, my phosphates were Super high, let's just say. Like, imagine a super high phosphate number. That. I feel much better about that than, like, zero, zero. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm not going to read your name. <laughs> the title of Gardens, have you ever battled red turf algae? If so, how did you manage to beat it? Um... <sighs> Hold on one sec, I need to like answer somebody's text. Um, okay. How did I, have I ever had red turf? And how did, I, how did I beat it? Yes, this was easily 10 years ago that I had this problem, okay? Uh, it was this insanely like, virulent, destructive red uh, red turf it would like grow into the skeletons of like my um, my Aussie like stony corals and literally like rip them apart it was, like it was insane it's like just it would go through their flesh and everything like that it was disgusting and it grew on absolutely everything just like thick mats of this stuff over all the rocks and everything what it involved us doing was removing all the rock setting it outside and killing it as far as like our tubs we would scrape it with a chisel and vacuum suction it using a big mag pump and sending it through a micron filter and then a uv sterilizer before the water would, would return and so it was a constant process of scraping and siphoning and filtering and uv sterilizing over the course of probably six months is how I beat it. So it's just a lot of a lot of diligence, a lot of work, and just nuking all the rock that had this red algae associated. Uh, Andy King is asking, Than, have you ever been tempted just to get a planted freshwater tank full CO2 the works? I think they're really pretty. Um, I never really considered getting one myself, but you know, you, you never know. Maybe like upstairs here in more of like the office spacey areas, I might set up like just like a, a smaller freshwater thing. There's a lot of cool freshwater tanks out there, but you know, I was just you know, I was talking about how I haven't had a a reef aquarium that I've had to you know aquascape and everything like that myself um, in a really long time. Practically double that, and now you're talking about my. When was the last time I did fresh water? It's been a while. Uh, Rob Scarvin, hi Than. Do you have an MBA? Yes, yes I do. Easy answer. 
Uh, Scott Morrison, are all mushroom corals okay to be placed next to other types of mushrooms? So like if you took like a, a discosoma and a rhodactus and you stuck the two together, they're going to fight. They're probably not going to fight enough to kill one another, but they're probably going to fight. Uh, and if I had to guess, the discosoma is probably going to win that one. So yeah, when in doubt, give them a little bit of room, give them a little bit of separation. Okay, doke. Yeah, I'm pretty much caught up. I think the rest of it is just two people arguing, and I'm not going to get into that. So, ATF in the house. Okay. Some suggestions on corals to cover and encrust uh, varied colors. Okay, so just some suggestions. I don't know if you're making a suggestion or asking. Uh, Favites, Samacora, Leptoceras, others, hard, hardiest. So, so first off, Favites is going to be really slow. You want something that, that's going to be sort of fast, but not crazy fast. Uh, but Favites is on the super opposite end of the spectrum. It's going to be really slow. Uh, I actually, of, of all the corals that I like to encrust over rocks, I really like Cyphastria. Uh, for I, I, like, I like the texture, I like the, the color options, things like that. Nathan, what's up? Remember the time I called you during live stream just to interrupt your live stream? That's what friends are for. Yeah, you did that. That might be the last time we actually talked on the phone. <laughs> True story, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, we need to get together again. I know that we, that I was at your house somewhat recently, but we should, we should hang out again. I don't see my friends enough. For those of us who love sand, how infrequent can I get away with not siphoning monthly? Some people say just having a cute can stir the sand regularly helps. So, Leslie, um, I'm probably a super hypocrite to answer you with anything other than very infrequently. So when I did used to have an aquarium, I, I would probably try to siphon it every time I did a water change. Now that I have like this coral farm thing, we have several tubs that have, um, that have substrate. And in many cases that substrate hasn't really been messed with in over a decade. So two extremes, right? I've done the uh, once per water change thing and I've done the never thing. I can pretty much tell you that the never thing is working out. We do have cucumbers in there, but we have chronically high levels of nitrate and phosphate, very high levels. Why, why am I saying it's working out? Our corals are doing just fine. And I'm talking like every type of coral under the sun, including high-end acros and stuff like that. They're liking it. But now that we know what we're dealing with in the, in the sense of these numbers, I would rather not have super high figures. I'd like high to semi-high is okay, but crazy high, not so much. So I would try maybe once a month at the longest like don't don't let it get completely out of out of control like a year two years ten years uh s2 minute fan have you ever used south down play sand and have you ever used it for a deep deep sand bed uh yes this is okay so guys way back in the day there was this stuff called south down play sand what it was, was what you would find from like a regular um, sand bag, like from Caribsi or whatever brand. And I forget what Caribsi was back then. Let's say just for the sake of fun, it was $20 for a bag of sand for, I don't know, like a 30 pound bag. I don't know. So just, just give you like an idea. Let's say it's 20 bucks for something like that. 
uh, this playground sand, South Down, used to be sold at certain Home Depots, okay? Not every Home Depot, and depending on where you found the South Down sand, it was either the silica sand, which was not what you wanted, or it was this pearly white Carib sea sand. Literally the same sand, separate packaging, okay? So the difference is, same sand, different packaging, difference is $20 versus like $350. It's like really cheap. So um, we even made a trip, this is way back in the day, we made a road trip to like a Home Depot in Pennsylvania to go and like buy bags of sand from to, to get this like cheap Caribsea sand. So yes, I have used it. Uh, looking at it now, uh, just for like large systems and, and especially on the farming end. And, I, and again, I have to say this is for like, for just for the way that we're doing farming and stuff here, I am leaning towards not using sand. Because uh, I, I am seeing where it is a, a maintenance issue long term and I'm not seeing a lot of the benefits that I'd like to other than appearance which I do think it looks nice but it's uh yeah it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make how's that warhood okay not sure if I understand your question but I'll give it a go what would be the minimum amount of gallons before you started to dose nutrients? Uh, I don't know what you mean. I could just start answering what I think you might mean, but I'm actually even drawing a little bit of a blank on that. Okay, Scott Morrison is asking, are Ghaniapora corals really hard to keep alive? Guy at my LFS told me to stay away from them. I won't, but are they that hard? So there's about 20 different kinds of Ghaniapora, 20 different species, if not more. Some of them are very delicate and have like a really bad reputation for survival. Um, that's where a lot of the... Um, the bad reputation comes from are these really fragile ones that are it's kind of like the, the three months and it's dead sort of thing uh, these days the ones that are coming out of Australia are very hardy uh, we've got like a nice little collection growing I'm super happy about it because I, I really like how Ghaniapora look and the ones uh, that that we've got have some really cool coloration like we've got this one that everybody now asks about it's like a sparkle I think my stream just died. My stream died. Um, giving it. A... Okay, so I'm still live. Okay, I'm just checking because, yeah, see, it keeps cutting out. My thing says is green now, but it might take a little bit of time. Okay, so anyway. It should be, uh, hopefully it's recovered by now. Yeah, every now and again we get like this massive lag spike. It's like, oh, stream is dead. So hopefully it's it's not too bad. Okay, good. I'm, I'm seeing that people are saying, oh, it cut back, but not, now we're good. Good. Who knows? Who knows? But yeah, Ghaniapora, um, we've, we've got a few in our collection. I wish we could grow them faster because there's this like really expensive one. And there's like a, a, like a 10 person wait list for it. And I'm like, I could use that money. I could, I could use to sell 10 of those. We just don't have 10 to sell. So hopefully soon.
<laughs> Keelan said, remember when you were hoping for this not to happen before the stream started? Yeah. So I, I, occasionally you get like a network freak out like that. But I'm, I'm just hoping that the entire application just doesn't straight crash. That's That's what I'm hoping for it to not do. Uh, Fish Lazy is asking, do you use different light cycles for any specific corals, on and off times, or sunrise, sunset times? Not for specific corals so much. Now, we do have, it, so in the, uh, in the greenhouse, we don't have anything even automated. It is like we show up, we turn it on, we leave, we turn it off sort of thing. So it's only regular in the sense of working hour regular. In the new building, so since we have all Radeon Pros, um, we hooked it all to Mobius and we've started to like just put in a, a real quick ramp up, ramp down sort of thing and we're done. Now, we are planning certain tanks to have certain corals, so we're adjusting the intensities that are going to be in those tanks. But that's, that's really it. We didn't go too, too heavily into that. So I'm like looking at my little list of, of talking things, and I think I covered them all. Uh, Marker Cerulius 187. Is that the orange Ghani that you had? No, the one I'm thinking about is called a glitter bomb Ghaniopora. It's, uh, it's green and purple speckled. Uh, S2 minute. I remember one person stated that they use an ounce of skimmate to feed their display tank and that the SPS would show great polyp extension. It's possible. I mean, it's if you if you equate skimmate to roughly uh, just amino acids and stuff, uh, you're talking about you know, dissolved organics, a lot of which are kind of protein based. Um, yeah, they, they, they might like it a lot. Uh, it's, you just don't want it to spoil in the water. So we're, we've gotten into, into dosing quite a bit of amino acids. Right now we're using Aquavitra Fuel. In the past we've used some other brands like Brightwell. Um, I might even take a, a stab at making my own amino acids just because we go through so much of it here. It might make sense for us to just figure out a little concoction of our own and, and try it, but haven't yet. Yeah, somebody was saying that um, uh, blah, 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 that uh, that their OBS was acting up yesterday. Yeah, the silent one was saying that. Uh, Lunatic Rider two hundred nine. Are you going to be doing any live streams in the new building? Technically, this live stream is in the new building, but I think what you mean is, uh, are you going to be shooting any of the any of the corals in the new building? And yes, we probably will. Uh, Leslie Stonebreaker, what is your favorite sand sifting uh, cleanup crew? Gobies, lots of detritivores. What kind of sea cucumbers do you have? Okay, so Leslie, my favorite is a fish uh, called uh, an orange spot diamond goby. Only problem, so by the way, I, I love that fish. It's tons of personality. They keep their they keep the sand bed sparkling clean white. Uh, they are super tame. They will eat out of a turkey baster, just you know, pump shrimp into their mouth. Uh, but the problem with them is they jump. So if you have a cover over your tank or a screen of some sort to keep them in, great. We leave our tops open, they jump out. Doesn't quite work out so well. Uh, but that is my absolute favorite. What we currently use are, um, I don't know what kind of cucumbers. We basically have like a tan colored one and a black one. I think they might be Caribbean, uh, and they do a pretty decent job. I just like them because I, I think, um, so I'm a big uh, Frank Herbert's Dune fan, and so I like, I think they're just like giant sandworms. <laughs> so that, that that's my choice. Dell's Reef, WWC says your first year with no sand is the hardest, after that it's great. Um, maybe. 
So I guess it, it's it's there's so, so many variables to it, right? Like, do you ever clean the sand, and is that problematic? How thick is your sand? All that fun stuff. So, like I said, uh, we've gone so, seriously. Some of our sand beds are over a decade old, uh, and I guess like, the fact that you know my systems aren't crashed. In fact, the corals are okay. Like this, the, this tank right here. What number are we on? We are on. Come on, overlay. Hurry up. It's 162. Okay. Well, did this tank ironically doesn't have a substrate? Very, very little in a couple of little 30-gallon tanks attached to this, but it doesn't really have a substrate. So this system here gets fed twice as much food as any other system, but it has half the phosphate and nitrates. Gets double the food, but half the residual problems, I guess. And it gets half the water changes of our other systems that have a sand bed. So, yeah, that's kind of what has me thinking about going with no sand bed for, for the farm in this new building. Over time, will we remove the sand next door? Maybe not remove it, but maybe at least try to make a better effort to siphon it. The way we have it set up, it's a pain to siphon. That's why we haven't done it in 10 years. Okay, let's see. Okay. A Darsh is asking, in my reef tank, there is so much tapeworms. Does it harm the coral if it does not? Then please suggest me to do some tips to remove it. I don't think you meant tapeworms. Uh, and it kind of matters what you really meant. If you really meant tapeworms, I have no comment for you. Flatworms, bristle worms, there's any number of things. Uh, so I'm just going to assume for a second, if you meant flatworms, I am not a huge fan of those. Um, there, there's a couple of different chemical things you could do to remove those. Uh, you, or certain fish can help you keep those under, in check as well. Things like certain types of damsels and wrasses. If you meant uh, bristle worms, 90 something percent of them that I've ever encountered are fine. I don't mind them at all. My employees don't like them because they pick up a rock and then they get stung, but that's their fault. Not the worm. The worm was just hanging out doing its thing. So I don't I don't mess with worms at all. Bristle worms, I should say. Uh, Darren, can I add to an order I already placed? Yeah. So if you just keep on, uh, if you place a second order, when you go to like the shipping method, all you have to say is just adding to uh, an existing order, and then we we combine it ourselves. So you're you're taken care of. Uh, Matthew. Than, do you have a suggestion for a mixed reef that has lower pH, 7.8 to 8.15, but the elk keeps climbing? I've run the skimmer airline outside, continuous water change, fuge running opposite, and calc in the ATO. So this is kind of a, a worry that I would have is that your, your salt water mix um, is naturally high in alkalinity. So you might, ugh, I don't even know if I want to say this, but you might want to do less water changes. What? So the, the, a big worry I've, I've always had is like some, some of these salt brands that, that have excess calcium, excess alkalinity, thinking that that's what, that's what reefers want. But when, you, when it comes time to ever needing to reduce that number, I mean, how do you go about doing that, right? You can't. So I would I always look for salt brands that are a little bit low, and then if I need to bump it up, I'll bump it up myself. Let me take care of that. Because lowering it, like Matthew it has, is having an issue doing, that's that's a real challenge. Like now you got some some problems. So what you might want to do is do a little bit fewer water change and see if your coral growth catches up to start absorbing that that excess alkalinity. Just a suggestion. I don't know what's going to work out for you, but that's that's a tough one. <laughs> Save nature. Do you know about DSR from Holland? Dutch synthetic reefing. No, I have not heard of them. Uh, Marcus Relius, do you use two part? Not no. I don't know if you're asking Matthew that or if you're asking me that. If you're asking me that, I use one part. I use the alkalinity portion. I don't use the calcium portion. 
Fish Lazy, thank you for your answer. It's a lot of help, and I'm enjoying watching. Uh, thank you. I don't remember what uh, <laughs> what your question was, but hopefully I did answer it, and hopefully, uh, and I'm glad to hear that you liked it. Uh, okay, so you have Matthew says no two part, uh, and yeah, so Marcus Aurelius, good. You're catching on to all this as well. It's you have to find out why it's going up. My biggest fear is it's your salt to begin with, so you might want to do a quick test on your salt to see if it's a naturally elevated alkalinity. Uh, Beth, Beth Stonebreaker, what are some unique coral types that are rarely found, maybe due to difficulty to breed aquaculture, but you think are super cool? Uh, I think stuff like acanthophilia are super cool, and you're going to be rarely finding those now because they are not currently um, they're not currently being aquacultured because you can't really cut them, uh, and the whole sexual reproduction of corals is kind of in its infancy. And I'm assuming that you're not going to see any really coming in legally from this point forward. From what I understand, Indo is only doing uh, farmed stuff, and Australia has eliminated that coral from its quota. So all acanthophilia coming into this country shouldn't be legal. So, and, and some of them are really cool looking, like amazingly colorful and beautiful corals. Uh, and just they were uncommon to begin with when it was completely legal but now there's a lot of roadblocks in place if somebody could learn how to uh, to, rep to reproduce those got my vote Steven Zimmerman hey first time catching the stream my question please is I've had to move my SPS to a new tank sooner than I wanted after upgrading and it's dying anything I can do to save it so if it's already starting to die it's going to pretty much go quickly. So what I would suggest is to start cutting it and getting it into the hands of friend hobbyists that can potentially save it for you, perhaps even a store, and then try to recollect those in time. Because if it's already starting to die off, that's usually like a 24-hour process, at least in my experience. Uh, Bert Ministry Than, what is the brightest glowing coral you've ever seen? Bling bling. Um, depends on what color you're looking for, but if you're just talking generally, the brightest colored coral is probably, in terms of like glowing, there's a few that are top of the list, but I would say a 24K Leptoceris is a bright, bright, highlighter yellow. Uh, uncommon color to have a lot of fluorescence in, and the intensity of that fluorescence is really impressive. Alex C. Lambert, are you able to keep a bubble tip anemone dominated reef and have zoanthids, mushrooms, and gorgonians in it? Uh, yes, except that the bubble tips will sting all those other guys. Uh, the zoanthids might survive. Mushrooms probably will survive. Gorgonians, likely to be killed, but possible. I've done it before, but I expect that the bubble tips will kill the, uh, the Gorgonians. Real quick, skipping to the bottom for a sec. Two please, four ninety nine. dollars thank you. Gotta go, Than. Working on wire management on the new setup. Nice, nice. Thanks for the great stream and all your hard work. Well, I, sorry, I threw in the grate myself. Give myself a pat on the back. Thanks for the stream and all your hard work. I appreciate you too, please. Uh, hope to see you again. S2 Minute, making your own amino acids. Interesting, would you please post a video on that when you do? Sure. We'll see if it's uh, any good. <laughs> we'll see if I'm any good at it, I should say. Okay, so it looks like we're on item number 177. I think we're going to 193, so we've got about a half hour-ish to go. Are you going to be a reefer for life? Glass film. Uh, well, it seems my life is almost over, probably. <laughs> I will probably be doing this for a little while, yeah. 
Uh, Keelan, do you think aquaculture of Christmas tree worms, worm rocks is viable with parietes? Do you think that it might be possible to reintroduce the worms into another stony coral? Um, you know what? I've never seen the worms reproduce. I'm sure it's possible, but I've never seen it. Like there's other um, feather duster type worms reproduce like crazy in my tanks, but specifically Christmas trees don't. I, I wish that were the case because it's cool. <laughs> Two please, smash those thumb, thumbs up people. <laughs> He's uh, just throwing that little dollar ninety nine, uh, like uh, that little fade away on his way out. <laughs> Thanks again, man. Okay, so going back to to Matthew's problem, I do run Red Sea Coral Pro, which does have elevated levels. Yeah, yeah, that could that could be the that could be the thing. Maybe consider doing uh, the Red Sea's lower grade, just so you might have less inter like potential chemical interactions. Because it, it might be too stark of a difference going from uh, Red Sea to like a completely different brand and then back and forth. There there's, could be some uh, chemical funkiness that can happen. Uh, let's see. Can you share your dipping and QT procedure? Thanks. Uh, so 007 LSV. Uh, yeah. So. The, the quarantine procedure so far has just been putting it in the tank and sitting there to look at it. But uh, there's actually two videos that you could check out in the meantime. Well, three. There's a really old one where I talk about dipping corals. Uh, and I think it's like just in acclimation in general for corals. So you can check that out. That's from several years ago. Then there is a more recent one about, uh, about the, the concept of quarantining. And then there's one about my actual quarantine tanks. That's the most recent video. So those are three that you can check out in the meantime. Adam says, inappropriate reefer does it. OK, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, inappropriate reefer is another person that uh, I have like not been able to meet up with. We've been in the same building once and we didn't meet up. It's like I, I was just leaving and I heard he was there. Like, you know, so, some of my other friends had talked to him. He's like, yeah, he's around. I'm like, okay, I'll just look around. And it was like a big place. So it's like I couldn't find him and then it was like time to go. And so I just never saw him. And then um, he was supposed to come to my barbecue thing uh, and he couldn't because he's like having a baby <laughs> or his wife was having a baby. So like that didn't work out. So you know, one of these days, like he and I are actually going to have to meet up. Uh, my DSB, my deep sand bed had 12 separate chambers, so when I wanted to change it out, I could siphon one compartment at a time. Oh, that's interesting. Old Man Reefer Than, what do you use to color your SPS? Um, honestly, our SPS have been more colorful at different times. The stuff that seems to be the most impactful just in, at least in my experience, is more aggressive water changes. So if, we're, if we were kind of slacking off and maybe like skipped a couple of weeks, when we got back onto schedule, I noticed like the corals perking up. And then when we were hyper aggressive for one reason or another, uh, I noticed an additional benefit. The next thing is to um, religiously feed them amino acids. Uh, that, that, that's, that's been a recent thing that I've been playing around with. But the amino acid train, I am on board. Like, I, it's to the point where I'm looking to make my own amino acids to save money on the, on the sheer quantity of amino acids that I'm going to be going through, especially once we start with this new building. So like this, uh, this, this golden goose acro at different times was like a solid green, not looking all that golden to like a ridiculously baller yellow acro. So like right now it, it's doing probably the best it's been doing. It's grown like crazy, got great polyp extension. And I think a lot of it does come down to that feeding regimen. So as clean a water as you can possibly get and, uh, and, and just hammering on the food. Uh, Bill, Car Bill Carlson is asking, you mentioned using one part elk. Isn't your... Uh, 
I'm going to guess calcium reactor, <laughs> providing equal calcium and alkalinity. Why the extra alkalinity? Uh, do you worry about the extra sodium coming in with bicarbonate contributing to ionic imbalance? Okay, so I need to do a video about alkalinity in general <clears throat> because I don't know how well understood it, it is. Um, <clears throat> so, so in layman's terms, the alkalinity of our systems is by far the most volatile parameter. If you looked at our, a graph of our magnesium and our calcium, it's basically straight line. You might get some dips and bobs in there. It's not a big deal. Our alkalinity is capable of crashing to like nearly nothing. So we're talking about like a healthy level of about 8 dKH down to like 2 dKH and everything in between. Calcium would never do that for us. Magnesium would never do that for us. So the reason why I think that um, you can get that volatility in alkalinity is because alkalinity is not a single compound. It's like a dozen different compounds that are all interchanging with one another. And those things together form this cloud of alkalinity that provides that uh, that stability buffer for your aquarium, the chemical stability. And any number of things can jostle that out of whack. Any number of things can consume one aspect of it and then again cause your readings to go crazy and having that affect your corals in different ways. So the, the stability that it provides sometimes undermines its own stability if that makes any sense. So that's kind of like why we, so there, there's a product out there called an Alcatronic, okay? And it only tests one thing, and it's only trying to test, to correct one thing, and that's alkalinity. And I, I'm thinking that like that product, even though it, it might not have like all the bells and whistles and everything like that, it's got one really big bell and whistle covered. And yeah, it's, the, the 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 effort to try to, to stabilize alkalinity I think it's gonna it's a, it's an ongoing issue for a lot of people so yeah long story short it is because that that is the volatile that that is the whole battle right there it's alkalinity <clears throat> uh, Leslie Stonebreaker what are your thoughts on dosing Fido I am pro dosing Fido. In fact, we've been dabbling with the idea of growing our own, um, but we haven't done it a lot. So for us to say, "Oh yeah, we we we're so, we're so, we love it," except we don't do it, it's because of laziness. But I am a proponent of it. I think it does a lot of good, and I think a lot of uh, of corals do consume it. And the Fido might even be consuming the amino acids and then get consumed by the corals. Like there, there's a lot of interactions that are potent, possible there. Uh, Alex C. Lambert is asking, what's a quick growing, easy to care for plating Montipora? They're all fast growing, relatively easy to care for. So it really depends on, on, on which colors you like. For me, I think that the orange ones and the green ones are a little bit old hat. Oh, looks like we're in overtime, guys. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to answer questions here. You see the timer that this is how the, the whole thing started. Uh, we might not get to the first coral back again. I don't know. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. But I'll answer the rest of these, these questions over time. You guys are getting a bonus. Uh, let's see. Okay, I was, I was talking about Monty's, right? So I'm kind of bored of the of the oranges. I'm a little bored of the greens. So if I was to choose, I like the purple ones, and I like the orange but with the yellow polyps. I think those are called like sunburst ones or something like that. I like those a lot. Uh, Adam says, I'm ramping up aminos as well. My corals came back from being transparent and nice, nicely colored, feeding refroids but still aminos as well. Yep, yep. Uh, Benny, hi Than, what might cause torch corals to have sort of fat and puffy tentacles but otherwise healthy? I thought they were long and flowing when I first purchased them. Any ideas? Uh, not sure. Some, some torch corals 
naturally have like a, a, a puffy tip, like a puffy white tip to their tentacles. Um, other possibilities, they could be sweeper tentacles and they have a kind of like a, a, a fatter, more uh, densely packed nematocyst tip. Uh, Keelan is asking, do you think you can explain a connection between coral color changes and lighting intensity? If a blue polyp turns red, do you think it would just need more energy to turn blue again? So there's a lot of things that, that can affect coral color other than light. Light is a big variable in that. It's going to have a huge effect for sure. But to, to try to have a coral express a specific color uh, might be a pretty big challenge to do just by adjusting light. And that is not to say by adjusting light that you won't affect the color of a lot of the other corals around by trying to affect the one coral, if that makes sense. So um, long story short, you want to work with consistency as much as possible. And if you're going to make any tweaks, only change one variable at a time to try to make that tweak. I mean, so some people, when they're trying to do that type of color change, that they're doing it chemically. They're going to be like, oh, I'm going to need to add potassium or add some exotic something or the other, like molybdenum or something, to try to like get corals to express. And, and, and feeding itself does, does different things. So a lot of variables to coral coloration. Uh, Patrick Dixon, how do you get such great images, setting filters, etc.? We actually don't use filters and stuff. So it's, it's not going to help you that that much. But we're working with like professional cinema gear and stuff like that here. So um, I, I'm glad you appreciate it. Uh, but the reason why we get such good video is because we're shooting with like a $10,000 video camera. <laughs> and it turns out that really expensive uh, like cinema gear performs really well in challenging situations like shooting our aquarium. So if you are curious to know more about like uh, the whole audiovisual setup and everything like that, uh, there is a video that we made maybe a few months ago worth checking out. It kind of goes over all the, the audio and video gear that we, that we use. So it, a lot of it has to do with that. Can you do it on a, on a, on a lower budget? Maybe, There's, the cameras are always improving, but you know, they're, at, at a certain point, it is just higher end tech. They, they make less uh, concessions as to you know, how they handle imagery and they charge people like me a premium for that. Uh, let's see. Is there anything about natural light of the greenhouse that you can that you will miss or be glad to be? So, so Charlie Harlan was asking that. Um, I think that there are some perks to doing the greenhouse thing. I think that a lot of corals do well in the greenhouse, and certain ones that that don't quite so much. And I've I've been joking for a little while now that it would really suck if we do all this thing with this new building, and it turns out like the secret sauce to getting like the great coral coloration was the greenhouse. <laughs> and we've built this state-of-the-art new facility and it's like, oh yeah, well, now your corals suck. That would be ironic and tragic. But yeah, it's the, the greenhouse has improved year after year after year. And over the years, we've now been able to keep just about everything we've ever wanted to keep out there. Uh, with varying degrees of success, but like for, we, we used to not be able to keep zoas alive. We used to not be able to keep acros alive. So we've come like a, a super long way in that regard. But um, I would like to have more space and to do stuff in a more laboratory controlled setting. And that's what this building is for. Keeping the greenhouse. So I guess what's, what's there to miss, right? I still have the greenhouse, but I, I know you meant by aspects of the greenhouse, but yeah. Upside DIY, do reefers disconnect from tropical fish and look for sharks? Don't really know what you mean, but I like sharks. In fact, whenever I have an opportunity, I pay dive companies a lot of money to take me out to show me them. <laughs> so I always joke about this video too, but I have a video where I went diving with sharks 
and YouTube hates it when you go off brand. So that's like one of my least viewed videos ever is my shark diving in Mexico video. But I had a good time. Okay, so Adam is asking, can you overdo aminos? Um, I'm sure you could overdo anything, but uh, I, I know of certain places that go really hard on aminos, much more than we do, and it seems to be okay. Uh, S2 Minute, have you ever tried the balling complete method? I have not. I have not. And have you ever considered growing red mangroves as a part of your system? I have considered growing mangroves. I've never kept a mangrove in my whole life, but I have one tank that might be well suited for that. And by the way, thanks Tech Gear Talk for putting in the, the gear video. Need to get that some more views too. Also, like basically if I'm not talking about corals or showing people's aquariums and stuff like that, uh, YouTube is going to, the algorithm is going to crush me. So. I, I know that some people were interested in the camera gear thing, and that's why I agreed to do it. But I knew going in that no one's going to see that video. I knew it because, like, YouTube, I, I already know your algorithm in and out. You want me to do a very specific kind of video. You want me to do top five lists of everything. <laughs> everything Coral Reef related. Top five everything. I get it, okay? But I'm mean, going to need to do some of my own videos here for a sec. <laughs> All right, Jeremy Young, second stream at work just went back to break. <laughs> yeah, this is um. So I appended the countdown timer to the beginning of the entire video because I used to have the countdown timer. I'm, this is a behind the scenes garble if anybody cares out there. I used to have a separate video for just the countdown, and then I would switch over the scene over to my actual coral list, and the reason why. Um, I stopped doing that is making that transition usually when you change scenes in like a broadcast software it's no big deal okay the problem here is I'm going from a regular scene over to this coral uh, live show thing that coral live show file is 30 gigs okay so whenever I just change scenes it freaks the hell out like my computer says, oh, about to catch on fire now. And then I get this huge lag spike. You guys probably see a glitch out on your end. It's like, what's going on? Like the live show broken? It's purely because, oh, I just asked the computer just to like, oh, hey, why don't you just load up this 30 gig thing into memory real quick and then broadcast it live? Like, is, is that a big deal? Can we do that like right now? And so yeah, it, it freaks out. So that's why I've appended this countdown thing to that. So when it does the freak out, it does it when I'm not live yet. And then I hit the live button, then you seamlessly just, you know, see the show start. So anyway, Greg Russo, $2. Thank you for sharing a wealth of knowledge. I, I appreciate you, uh, Gregory. Any and all support, I am real cool with. Obviously, not required, but always appreciated. Always appreciated. Uh, King's Coral, $2. Thank you as well. Uh, Sean Davis, I've seen your shark diving videos. The shark get, kept looping around and bumping that poor diver on the end. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I wish I was that guy. Uh, let's see. Finishing up here. Greg Russo, do you expect to have uh, increasing margins on the livestock to cover expenses for the new building? Really, when it comes to um, the, the, the pricing of stuff, I think we're always going to be competitive. Like, uh, we're uh, we're not the cheapest in town, but you know, occasionally we'll do like live streams that that have some stuff on discount. We'll do flash sales, like the Friday flash sales, a new thing that we started up doing. So hopefully, you know, there there's like pockets where you can you can find some good deals, especially on stuff that we're looking to to uh, <clears throat> to clear out. So yeah, as long as we're selling coral, everything's fine. Like, I don't think that we need to like go crazy and raise prices or anything like that. No, <clears throat> we've been paying everything up to this point. So it's not like, oh no, we've got loans to pay. No, it'll be fine. So I, I wouldn't expect any anything super crazy. All right, guys, that pretty much does it. You got the 12 minutes of overtime also. So hopefully you guys enjoy the rest of your weekend. Somebody was texting me earlier about going to see a UFC fight. I guess like, I guess Conor McGregor's fighting tonight. 
So anyways, I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend and I will catch you all next time. See ya.